Welcome to our presentation on the detection of brute force attacks in end-to-end -end encrypted network traffic. I am Pascal Wichmann, and this is joint work together with Matthias Marx, Hannes Federath, and Matthias Fischer. Let's first consider the scenario of brute force attacks on the internet. So we have an attacker over here, and that attacker uses the internet to attack some service, for example, a website or an SFTP server. Now we can employ an intrusion detection system and try to detect and perhaps prevent such attacks. In the traditional scenario, all of these communications between the attacker and the server have been unencrypted. That is, we have been able to look into the contents and, for example, see whether traffic contains login attempts or whether that is a legitimate user that transfers data to the service, for example. However, nowadays there is an increasing prevalence and more and more connections are encrypted and more and more services allow the use of end-to-end -end encryption. While this is good, it also makes it more difficult to detect attacks without access to the contents because now, due to this end-to-end -end encryption, the internet and especially our IDS can no longer access the contents of the traffic. However, we still have access to the metadata. That means we can see how many packets there are, how often the attacker sends a packet, and all this other metadata aspect that are not related to the contents. Let's have a look at the schematics of a boot force attack. So we have an attacker, and that attacker sends several authentication attempts to the server. So he starts, for example, with the username admin and the password 1234 and tries to log in at the server. This could be, again, a website or SFTP or an email server. Now the server validates these credentials and sees that they are invalid. And therefore, in response, the server sends some protocol message that indicates to the user, or in this case the attacker, that this authentication attempt is invalid. So the root force attacker continues with different credentials and again gets such an invalid credentials message from the server. And so on and so on and so on until perhaps the attacker may be successful by guessing valid credentials. In that case, the server would provide actual contents, for example, if this is a website, the password protected web page. So what we observe here is that very often the server responds with this invalid message. This uh, could be some kind of protocol message or in case of a website, it may also contain some specific error page of the application. However, we, we observe that very often these messages are always identical or at least very similar. And this also is uh, visible in the sizes. So they are all the same size in this example, whereas the actual content example here is much larger. And also if we consider legitimate use of this service, we have a user and that user has valid credentials right from the start. And now that user requests different parts of that service, for example, different paths of a website or different files from an SFTP service. And then the user always gets the responses that has, have been requested. And often they have different sizes, unlike the brute force example, where all responses were equally sized, the sizes differ now. Of course, there could still be some responses that are we are by chance to have the same size, but at least not all responses are the same size, and this should happen not as often as in the brute force case. And therefore, we perform some assumptions about brute force attacks. We assume that they result in very specific traffic patterns that make them discernible from legitimate traffic. So first, we assume that there are more connections or at least TCP packets than using legitimate use. Because we assume that a brute force attacker needs to use a connection or at least a packet for each end. Then we assume that a brute force attacker causes a high number of short living connections to be opened. That is connections that last only a very short fraction of time. And lastly, we consider equally or similarly sized responses. That is, we assume that, as we have just seen in the example, a brute force attack causes such a similar sized or equally sized response. We have constructed five metrics from these assumptions and try to defer attacks from legitimate traffic using them. So all of these five metrics use a time window of length P and uh, 
we have five of these metrics. They are very simple metrics, and we in the next step will choose thresholds for them. But we were able in our evaluation to achieve rather good results in attack detection using these simple metrics without the requirement to use machine learning or other more complex computations. And therefore, they are rather simple to apply. The first metric considers equally sized response packets. And with response packets, we mean PCP packets that are sent by that party of the connection that did not initiate the opening of the connection. So usually the user opens a connection to the server, and then we would assume any packet sent from the server back to the user to be a response. Next, we consider a similar sized response, and that is very similar to the equally sized, only that we now allow a deviation of up to d bytes in order for two packets to be considered similarly sized. Next, we consider the number of TCP connections that are opened by a specific source. The same we do for TCP packets, as explained before. And perhaps a, a service allows uh, to keep a connection open. Therefore, TCP connection counting wouldn't be sufficient. However, then an attacker would still need to send multiple packets in order to perform multiple authentication attacks. And our fifth metric counts these short living TCP connections that are connections that have a duration of at most a seconds. To detect attacks using our metrics, we build a method that uses one or multiple metrics M and combines them with a threshold tau. Then we collect this metric for every single traffic source, that is for every source IP address. And if this value within a time window exceeds our threshold T, then we classify that source as attacking. We could also, instead of performing this per source, use a destination-oriented approach. That is, instead of counting each metric per source, we could count the metric per destination host. And therefore, instead of detecting who is attacking, we could detect who is being attacked. To evaluate our metrics, we have implemented them in the Zeek framework. Zeek allows to analyze network traffic and provides several features that make that task easier. And in order to evaluate data, we need data sets. There are a lot of data sets that already exist and have been used in the past to evaluate intrusion detection systems. However, they do not focus on encrypted traffic. While some of them do contain encrypted connections, they do not focus on them and therefore are not that suitable for our evaluation. Instead, we have generated an own synthetic but still realistic data set and used that for our evaluation, as well as using real-world traffic from a Tor exit node that is operated at our university. Now we see results for HTTPS and FTPS. And first, we consider the similar sized responses metric. And there we can see that we have the precision, the sensitivity, and the F measure. So the precision is the proportion of classified attacks that are actually attacks, so the attacks that we have correctly classified as attacks. Then we have the sensitivity. The sensitivity, or also called the recall, is the proportion, proportion of actual attacks that we have detected. And the F measure is the harmonic mean of both values. So what you can see here for the HTTPS example, that we reach for a threshold of 1000, that we reach perfect detection. That is, we detect all attacks that have been, uh, been within our data set. And we also do not miss any attacks and neither create any false positives. Still, 1000 is a rather high threshold. So if we want to achieve perfect detection, we would need to assume that our brute force attacker has very high numbers of authentication attempts that he performs. Next, we consider short living connections for the FTPS protocol in this example. And again, we see that we have a very high F measure, that is, we are close to 100%, so above 90% at least. And still, this is also for a very low threshold, so we consider only 10. And there already we have a very high F measure. If we increase the threshold, it later starts to reduce, just like in the HTTPS case. Next, we compare the impact of time window. So we have the IMAPS protocol in this example. And first, we consider a time window of five minutes. 
and then we consider a time window of 20 minutes. And what we can see here is that in both cases, already for low thresholds, there are yeah, somewhat acceptable values for the F measure, and especially the sensitivity starts with 100%. And um, then later, the F measure starts to get a little bit better until for very high thresholds, it gets very low. And if we consider a higher time window, the F measure, because now in the high, longer time window, we have more data. And therefore, the, for higher thresholds, the F measure also gets a little bit higher and also stays a bit higher. So we can see that different time windows Im impact the results of our detection greatly. And therefore, one needs to consider which time value to choose. While on the other hand, the longer the time window, the longer it takes possibly until we detect in a time. Our other part of the evaluation, as explained, has been performed on a Tor exit node. So in the Tor network, there's a client that wants to access some service on the internet. And that is, and the traffic is routed through the Tor network. So we have an entry node that forwards the traffic to the middle node, that again forwards the traffic to the exit node, which then sends the request to the specified service. However, every node only knows who is before it and who is after it. But for example, we on the exit node have no idea who the entry node or the client is. So we have no idea which, what the source IP address could be. And for privacy reasons, we also, of course, do not want to use the middle node, so we know who the middle node was. We don't want to use this information. We have run the IDS, we have implemented on the exit node, and um, we use the destination-oriented approach and I've explained earlier. That is, we have detected attacks per destination rather than per IP address of the source. The uh, advantage of the Tor evaluation is that we have real internet data, so actual data not only synthetically generated. However, there's very rare ground truth available. We did get some abuse messages, and through them we have some limited amount of ground truth, but except for them, there is no ground truth. We've run our analysis for 31 days and analyzed a traffic volume of 5.7 terabyte in this time window and that comprised 70.5 million TCP connections. We have also received 13 abuse messages, though only 10 of them have been useful. That is, for only 10 of them, we were able to find any IP address that was actually attacked. Zeek also provides an, a detection for SSH brute force, and we have been running that as well in our Tor exit node. And the Zeek detection has detected almost 1,900 brute force attacks in, during our evaluation, whereas uh, two of our metrics have detected a much higher number. And uh, almost all of the attacks that Zeke has detected have all, were also been detected by our metrics. But in addition, we have also detected high numbers of attacks that were not detected by Zeke. So of course, as said before, we do not have ground truth, so we cannot certainly tell whether these are false positives or what amounts of them are false positives. Okay, so to conclude, we have proposed an attack detection method that supports encrypted traffic, and our metrics are very simple and mostly protocol independent. That is, except for the threshold, the metrics do not need to be adapted to a specific protocol. And in our evaluation, we have been able to very reliably detect attacks. However, there are some limitations to our approach. So first of all, we do not detect slow attacks. So a brute force attacker that is very slow and spreads his attack over a long time is not detected if the thresholds are chosen too high. This is the second limitation. We mostly need to choose rather high thresholds in order to detect attacks. That means also that we and can detect attacks only very late. We mean to address these limitations in future work. So first, we'd like to prove the detection of very slow attacks. Then we would like to consider distributed attacks and be able to uh, yeah, improve the detection of distributed attacks that are not originating from a single source, but from multiple sources. Then we'd like to use honeypots to collect more test data and to evaluate our methods. And lastly, we could apply machine learning in order to analyze more traffic features and base our attack detection on a higher number of traffic features. Thank you very much for your attention.